oh shit, this fucker is going to stop me making more ads and having fun with agencies. It's like most marketing podcasts are so full of cock and nonsense and pointlessness. <laughs> What John just dropped there is like a real, a double humdinger in my piece. See, if I was Cadbury, I'd be well fucked off. I have to say that makes me quite emotional because I've got a daughter that age. And um, that's lovely. Welcome back, everybody. It's the Uncensored CMO. Now, we are closing out 2022. Now, I'm sure you're wondering right now, which of the ads this year actually made any difference and which were, let's say, not so good. Um, well, fortunately, at System One, we have the data. We know what works and what doesn't work. So I thought I'd get together the none other than our favorite marketing professor, Mr. Mark Ritson himself, and we we're going to have a good old chat about ads and what works and doesn't work and what we can learn as marketers that will make us more effective as we go into 2023. And don't forget, everybody, if you're listening on audio, you can also watch on YouTube over at Uncensored CMO. So I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Ritson. Hello, Welcome John. Show. How are you? Good day and Merry Christmas. Good to see you. I'm I'm delighted to be here. I'm Good. definitely not hungover. Everything's super clear. But being together physically, which always sounds like we're having sex, um, being together physically is great. Mate. It's a nice yeah. thing. It's a it? nice thing. We should yeah. do it more. Nice thing at Christmas. <laughs> a little bit of Christmas sex. Right, Mark, got a few quick fire questions for Come you. On, let's go. Biggest cock up of 2022. What would that be? I, I think it's going to be the World Cup, right? I mean, it's been a successful tournament, but at the commercial level, I just think how it's making FIFA look, how it's making Qatar look, even though they're spending all this money on it, how it makes football look is is probably ridiculous, right? And the sponsors as well are probably pretty pissed off and ashamed of it as well. So from what should have been an, an astonishing opportunity, if it had been done correctly in the right place, you know, wherever that might be, it's turned into the exact opposite. So you're a massive cocker. Now, I'm a big fan of your marketing bullshit top 10 right yes what are you going to add to that based on 2022 there's quite a lot to there's uh, got to be a lot of contenders right for I, making I, your top 10 I'm, i think in the end i have a lot of options here I, i'm going to put full funnel marketing in there Ooh. and the reason i'm doing it is that it's a in concept it's a good idea and what it basically means is performance marketers actually need to realize there's there's a, there's a lot more there's to, a bit above there's a bit above <laughs> But what I'm seeing is it doesn't play out that way. What happens is they assume it means target every stage in the funnel, which is the opposite of good strategy. So full funnel marketing in the sense we should consider all the stages, amen to that. Full funnel marketing, we should target every step along the way all the time, not good. So I think that's the bullshit part. Uh, what's the biggest surprise for you in 2022? It's probably the... It, the significant immolation of the digital firms in terms of their, not their market position, but their valuations. We've got so used to 20 years of them being so big and so strong. And yet you look at what's happened to pretty much all of them, you know, and some of them significantly. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a, I'm not quite sure what it indicates yet, but it's a big surprise that I, I wouldn't have bet on that a year ago. And then, and then Les comes out with some data from Meta that <laughs> just goes, you used to spend 60% of your, of your money on, on long-term advertising. Yeah, and I, th I think we might see that, right? So I yeah. think what these companies are already starting to do, might do more of, is realize we're mature incumbent businesses, slightly dusty now. What we need is a bit more branding. Do you know what I mean? And that could well be the case next year. Yeah, interesting to watch. Um, which brand has impressed you the most? I'm going to say Unilever because I give them so much shit um, and yet they're such a good company with such good people. They are actively rewinding a lot of the purpose wank. And that takes a lot. You know what I mean? We've seen other organizations that will never do that. So I, I think, give them their credit, they are rebalancing things in a sort of post Alan Job era. And so I think that's important for marketing because they led us into this naive, bonkers concept that, you know, purpose can make you money, which is literally a contradiction in terms. And now they're kind of leading us around the corner to somewhere a bit more realistic. And so we've got to give them credit. They're brave and they're, you know, they're doing it for the right reasons. So yeah, I, you know, I still think they're a great company, just wrong. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. What's the one thing you learned this year? I probably learned the most, I'm not just saying because you're here, I probably learned more from System One. Some of your team gave me some amazing data, but showing essentially in a nutshell that if you do really good brand building work, it has a short-term performance effect. But the reverse is not true. If you do really good short-term performance work, it's much less likely to have any impact on brand at all. 
And so that explains something we've all been aware of, which is companies that just focus on performance because it still, you know, makes you money. Uh, that's why they're missing out on brand. Whereas companies that have a full branded approach are getting that short term stuff anyway. So that's a nuance that the data surprised me. And it took a while to sort of see what it meant, but I think that and it makes intuitive sense once you get it, right? It's a great data point. I mean, we've, we've been working with Boots, we've been working with Audi, and actually what they've done is is built, you know, consistent campaigns and they can see the short-term impact of those, you know, when those campaigns run in terms of activation as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it pays off. The more you do it, the, the better off the short-term payoff as well. I suppose where you are with your data though, you can also point to the outliers who do great short-term activation and build brand as well and what we can learn, right? Yeah. So that, I, I personally, I don't think that's that's achievable very often and there's nothing wrong with performance for performance sake, right? But I, yeah, I think it, it adds a nuance that we haven't had before. Well, this comes to the ROI point, doesn't it? If, if we're obsessed with ROI and that becomes our measure, we'll keep on repeating the performance, putting more and more money into that and we'll miss the long-term brand opportunity. Yeah, I mean, an, an intriguing idea is if we can sell companies on long-term brand building, having a short-term impact as well, it's almost a two-for-one, maybe that's an easier sell. But having said that, I think one of the nice things of this year is two things, I think. We, we're seeing, I think, more companies understanding the nature of brand building and what it can do. And I think it's the first time in human memory we're going into a recession with a pretty consolidated, strong argument for maintaining advertising investment. Well, that brings me to my next question, actually. What's going to matter in 2023? Because it's, it's a pretty unusual set of circumstances that we as marketers find ourselves in. Yeah, it's stagflation, right? To use the old term that hasn't been around for 50 years. We've got stagnation of the economy, and we have this rampant inflation, at least for a bit longer. So the two challenges for next year are going to be main, maintaining that advertising investment, because we will get through this, and there are advantages, as we know, to maintaining ad spend for when the recession ends. And then also, the one I'm most passionate about, which is marketers getting involved in pricing and price rises, so that we can do proper research to get the right price, and then we can frame and communicate that price rise in such a way that it doesn't do much damage to the organization. And... I don't think we'll see many. We, we'll, we've got a few examples, but we, we need more marketers that will stop talking about advertising and focus a bit on helping the companies with price. Actually, damn right. But whenever in my career I've, I've lent into that, those kind of decision-making processes, mm. the credibility you get as a marketer just yeah. goes off the scale. So you know. That's a key point, right? So it, it's a real opportunity, right? Because your company is going to have to put its prices up. They're going to do it badly because they haven't got any marketing data. You could step in. It's a pretty simple playbook. Mm. Not take charge of pricing. That's bullshit. But feed into those decisions, as you say, impress yeah. people. And the other thing about pricing, which everybody forgets, is like in my consulting career, if you do an amazing job on a company's brand, the client's really happy. And he's like, you know, oh, the positioning work was great and blah, 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 and we're still doing it, blah, blah, blah. But there's no explicit sense of what it was worth. I haven't done that much work on pricing. I've done a bit of work on pricing. When you do a project on pricing and you get it right – the company knows exactly how much fucking money you've made them, right? Literally exactly. And, when, and that's a hell of a ROI conversation when you've got your fee here and the gigantic implication of that pricing, you know, success. So I think for those two reasons, marketers have an opportunity here. And, and I don't, I, frankly, I think it takes about two days to get up to speed on, on standard pricing theory from a marketing point of view. We're not trying to be economists here. There's a playbook there. And if we could apply it, huge opportunities. Yeah, say. totally. I mean, compare that to comms where you've got like sometimes a year of development, huge spend, loads of complexity, and then another year of MMM trying to figure out in the rearview mirror, did it work or not? And, and then, then some other fucker takes yeah. the credit anyway. Yeah, right? exactly. So, and then you're fired because it's two years later. Yeah, 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 and that's yeah, yeah. the average CMO. So, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It, I, I hope we get a few marketers who are, you know, confident enough to have a go at this. It's not a precise science, and it's not like we're trying to do something better than other parts of the organization. It sounds weird, but when most companies set price, they look at their costs and they look at competitors, neither of which are actually main factors in making good pricing decisions, right? You have to understand value, and therefore you have to understand the customer that's judging the value, and only marketers could do that. And, and the other point that I'm passionate about is that if you really understand pricing, the price is less important than the manner in which we frame and contextualize the price, yeah? And... 
I just think only marketers get that point. Everyone else is obsessed with what the price, physical price should be. Marketers are able to anchor and contextualize price, make the actual price much less important in the process. Yeah. The other experience I've had is, is everyone gets obsessed about the price point and forgets the average realized price when so much of your effort goes into promotions and displays and all that kind of it. thing. And it's, it's the end price that the consumer pays that's the most important one, not the... Totally. And, yeah. and look, if you look at OCC, OCC the, the retail consulting firm, they've, they've for decades have had that research that shows most customers have no idea what the price of things are that they've purchased. Yeah. Like within 40, 50 percentage yeah. points. You know what I mean? So that tells you there's wiggle room and that tells you that we can have an influence on what is perceived value or, or what isn't, you know. So, yeah, I hope we, it, it, it starts a, a pricing revolution. Um, I don't think it will. <laughs> but, again, we don't. I mean, the key point I always make is I don't care if general marketers are useless. As long as the, the good ones that get trained and are committed and represent our industry well and work for my clients are good, it's kind of good that the rest yeah. of them are bad. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, good marketers, smart marketers will take this opportunity. Brilliant. Well, let's let's move to another peak. So obviously, we're, we're, here we are in System One HQ. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> can we talk about some ads, please? You know. <laughs> so, anyway, but at least we bring some data to the to the conversation, yes. which be, which would be a nice, yes. refreshing yes. change. Um, so let me just for anyone listening and watching, just chat through just how we do things at System One. So when we when we talk about star and spike and fluency, everyone gets it. So um, we measure we measure the emotional response to advertising, and we turn that into a five star rating, right? So we, we we nick this from Uber, made it really simple, right? Is it good? You know, one, one to five star. One being absolutely zero impact on the business whatsoever. No potential to drive any long-term market share, right? Up to five star, which is significant potential. We've worked out three percentage points plus, assuming excess share of voice, right? So we, you know, we, what do you do? We, plus 10? We build it. Plus 10. Yeah. We take the ESAV, apply that, and then we the, the weight the creative impacts on top of that. And I'll tell you what's interesting, right? And back to Les Burnett's point. You don't have you, you start at one, you don't go to zero or minus one. And it backs up what Les has always said, right? You can have terrible advertising. It, he's never seen an ad ever do any damage to the brand. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just doesn't do any good, which yeah. is kind of backed up by yeah. your, your rating. Exactly. That's right. Um, and then what, what we find in the database, 48% of every, ads we test. Now, we're over 80,000 ads and counting at the moment are one star. So predicted to have no long-term impact on the brand. So the old Wanamaker quote, when 100 years old now, isn't it? Half my advertising is wasted. I just don't know which half. Well, we do now, but it is about half, which is interesting. Um, the other, and do you think they were intending to do that, or is that? Can we argue some of it is they were? Actually- I think it's both. Yeah, I, I think there's looking at it. It's it's partly that it was designed for activation. So you know, sofa sale at the weekends. You know, come on in, but you know, half then. price, it's right? Doing so doing. that's doing the spike. And then you've got ads that are supposed to be doing brand building that just aren't. So, I mean, this is where Orlando comes in with, you know, he, how the effectiveness of creative has declined, how we're focusing on what you describe as more left brain kind yeah. of. It, it's almost like I love the Tom Roach quote, actually, where he was doing some work for us on, we call it scaling up without screwing up, right? It's what can new brands learn from established brands? We found out that it took four years for a new TV advertiser to get to the star rating of an established advertiser. So we just wrote this guide about, well, what can a new advertiser learn? At the end of it, he had this great quote, which is, you know, back in the day, we say, don't just put your TV ad on social. Well, now it's just don't put your social ad on TV. Because what we're finding is it's that, it's that social dis- digital discipline of like very flat, lots of messages, you know, quick cut scenes, you know, short form. Yeah. It's that that's been using in, in that, you know, that's been taken using brand building. And, and that, that's what our database is showing is not, not as effective. Well, and it makes sense. We've passed the digital sort of half mark now where that's the dominant approach. Yeah. So now they're, dump, as you say, dumping digital ads onto TV rather than the other way around yeah. as it used to be. That's fascinating. Now, there is, there is, there is hope because we are seeing, uh, you know, well, this Christmas, we'll come back to Christmas in a minute. Oh. This Christmas was the best Christmas on we've ever, we've gone back seven, eight years now, Christmas ads. It was the best by quite some margin actually this year. So there's some evidence that, you know, there's, there's a return to form. What I thought I'd do is... Well, hang on, because I've yeah. got a question for you. Go on. Are we... I, I mean, I, I, there's a certain... Uh, I, I'd be fancy and call it metier, but, you know, it, there's a certain style, house style or approach of doing Christmas ads, right? Uh, John Lewis down, right? Where the orphan adopts the puppy and, yeah. and, and in the dim lighting we hear a, re, you know, a rehashed version of Slade or something. Are we going to reach a point where that zagging requires zigging? You know, because it's getting better to your point. 
But is it getting better to a stage where we're almost generifying it and there's probably room for something else? Do you sense that? Or I, is- I, I think this is almost certainly the point because actually th- this year has been such a transformation. And, and what was interesting is the World Cup and Christmas going at the same time. So mm. people have to make a decision, which do you do? It looks like most people went Christmas and they really leaned into storytelling, nostalgia, yeah. which actually was a pretty smart thing to do because what the data shows is in recession – actually what people want is escapism. They, 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 they yeah. want to be reminded of the things that don't change. And actually Christmas one of those things. Christmas is perfect. Christmas is perfect. So actually everyone got it right. But to your point, what we find is, I mean, retailers particularly got it right this year. You know, Audi, M&S, Lidl, Tesco, uh, Morrison's as well. But what we know from Orlando's work is what makes a difference to long-term share is your relative performance versus your category. Hmm. So what we notice, it's a bit like ESOV, but creatively. Yeah, creative so ESOV. It's creative ESOV, exactly. What we find is almost all of them are doing five-star advertising now because they're looking at, well, the most successful is Audi, right? Kevin the Carrot, consistent four-year five, five-star. And, a complete, and a complete strategic invention yeah. that kind of realized all of this. And went, right, how do, we, how do we, on top of all these already great performance layer, how do, we, how do we do a John Lewis of our own? And they did it, right? They did. They did. But that's fascinating because what it says is, okay, it might not be a, a trend that will change. You know, it's all going to be warm and happy Christmas. But the effectiveness of that work may not be as strong because everyone essentially is it's good relative. and doing the exactly. same thing. Now, the, the interesting thing uh, about... But, but it doesn't yeah. mean they shouldn't do it because if they don't... It's now table stakes. Huh. Now, the interesting thing with Audi, where I think Audi is better than John Lewis, right? John Lewis reinvents the genre every year. Yeah. They get a hit and then they get a miss. Yeah. I mean, our data would suggest they're up, then they're down, they're up, then they're down. But every year it's different. Now, they've created a an event around their ad, right? It's the most anticipated ad. So to some extent, that's working for them. What Audi do is they change the ad, but they keep the keep the character, you know, Kevin the Carrot. They keep the construct similar. And and what we've seen is that, you know, what we, we would say familiarity breeds contentment, actually, because year in, year out, that score goes up. Now they get a bit better at the storytelling and, and whatever, but actually it's broadly... It's the cumulative you know, familiarity exactly. of the device. Yeah, and, and you see that play out on social, you see it in store. And what's amazing is actually they're very unusual in that their activation ads, even their... Audi price match ads can get five star because they're leveraging all the stuff they do above the line is in store in terms of characters. It's, mm. uh, you know, it, it's in activation, it's in social media. They're brilliant at, you know, literally well, listening to it together. Now that interests me a lot, right? So you're saying it's possible to have a short term performance campaign selling more tins of beans. Yeah. But if you use your distinctive assets, fluid devices, whatever it might be, fluent devices, whatever it might be, there is a possibility, if it's strong enough, that the short also does a lot of long at the same time. Yeah. Now, that's not very common, I would imagine. I would say it's probably the single biggest hack. If you, if you want to connect short and long, the single biggest hack is find a fluent device that's distinctively yours and is obvious. Because what it, what it does in advertising right. terms, it's a shortcut, right? So you it, see it Kevin. Re, it just relights it up again. It, you go, Kevin, it's Audi. You feel something. All that emotion you've built it, from it's, your long brand It's work. all in there, yeah. My favorite one, actually, is uh, Churchill the Dog. Right, so direct line, brilliant advertiser. They, they, they'll do a thirty-second, you know, Churchill on a skateboard, oh. yeah, brr, brr, Churchill, brr. you know, Churchill going down a slide or something, right? But their five-second version of that, which is designed for social, will be just as effective because they've they've got they've got you with the dog, right? Dog on a skateboard. I remember it from the you know above the line, but I'm, I also feel the emotion because of the years of investment in Churchill. Well, and it means you can slide in whatever product stuff you're trying to do. Stick in the dog at the end, and you, as you yeah. say, you're getting both done, right? Exactly. So it does even more put that emphasis on distinctive assets, uh, on creating something that a brings it to mind straight away in the Ehrenberg Bass style, but also to the System One point, actually enables you to put a bit, slide a bit of brand equity in there while you're also doing your exactly performance. And then you might have you might have kind of scenario fluent devices like should have gone to spec savers, not you when you're hungry. Those kind of recurring ideas, you know, that, that just come up, crop up in different, you know, in-store, yeah. cro- online, above the line, right? They're also clever Works because it's just, oh, I see a poster that, that's been like, up, been put upside down. You go, that's a spec savers. You almost don't need to say it. You just, see, you, you just see the idea and you can associate, you know, that back to spec savers immediately. Well, and it should work with, I mean, I'm always disappointed with this insight whenever I deliver it. But um, whenever you look at distinctiveness and codes and assets, the the king or queen of them all is the jingle, right? Or as we yes. call it, the 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 in modern pods, the sonic brand cue, right? It smashes 
all the other distinctive assets. And given we know music is incredibly evocative and emotional, you would imagine that of all the things you could play, music would also, jingles would, you know. Huge. Would huge. be huge, right? And I it, can, yeah, I can tell you the data on this, actually. So we, we've done this studies. This I love, John. I just yeah. talk a load of shit. <laughs> Here's the data. And then you go, I've got, it turns out that <laughs> yeah. one's true. Man. Oh, it is, yeah. Here's there you go. Data, so like, yeah, very good, John. Here's one you'll like. Werther's Original, right? So we, we were doing some testing for Werther's Original. Uh, you know, beautiful scene, a dad and his daughter, you know, playing in the park, right? You can imagine the kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But very sweet, nostalgic. Falling leaves, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't, yeah, you don't need to imagine too hard to imagine the creative. Three different soundtracks. One soundtrack got a three star, one got a four star, one got a five star, right? It took, it transformed it from an average, well, above average ad to an exceptional ad. The interesting thing about the soundtrack is what we saw in the survey feedback was with the sad soundtrack, the three star, People assumed the dad and the daughter were on a visitation day and that the, the parents were divorced, right? That's a sad It is, isn't it, right? That's a dream, mate. And then in the five-star ad, they assumed it was her birthday and they were out having a party. And it was the, the, it same, was the cut. same cut, right? Different music because it changed how you felt. And, and the emotion and, of the system one drives yep, the system two rest like Exactly. Okay. So it changed the emotional trace and it changed how you interpreted it. It changed the association with the brand only through the music. I'm just disappointed because I thought when you said, you know, you're three star music, it was just going to be something really inappropriate like AC, yeah. ACDC. You know what I mean? Yeah, we should always suggest that next time. That would be surprising. Stick, you, never yeah. know. you never know. Exactly. Bit of academic. Well, the, the other thing as well, I mean, the, the classic one is Coke holidays are coming, right? So run for 25 years. Is it 25 years? 20, it's 25 years now. I was right? it was 15. And that's, um, I mean, we invented this thing called the Coke. Oh, this is another good reference. We invented the Coke truck index, right? So the we, Coke truck. the Coke truck index, right? It's, it's a bit like the Mac index. In your own crack. I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but because we've got the data going back uh, at least 15 years now, we can see that that's gradually got better. It was a three and a half star. It's now five star. Literally the same ad. Same ad. Literally, well, tiny digital improvement. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but, you, know, you wouldn't notice. So it has proven that things wear in over time as people get more familiar, creatively wear in, right? Which is brilliant. Now, the interesting thing about that, of course, is you listen to the radio, right? Or you're out of the room and it's on the TV. You know exactly what it is because you've got holidays are coming. So the benefit of that jingle is incredible because it just breathes that familiarity. And people in the survey go, Christmas has started because the Coke, I heard the Coke ad on the radio. That's you know, it, it, it's, that's, exact, that's the power of that jingle. I mean, I think there's two phases for Coca-Cola who I don't rate that highly anymore, right? I think they're a fine company. And they did well to maintain Coke in what's a declining category, right? They deserve a bit of credit, I think, because they've got, I mean, they just going back to the, to the truck is, is a real sign of genius and not creating new stuff for the sake of it. But they're still not doing enough with the truck. Do you know what I mean? Like playing the old, that is the start. But that looks to me like it's got legs for other things. It used to go on tour, didn't it? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it used to it turn up. It seemed like an obvious thing. Yeah. And, we might and, have made that up as we were, we, 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 I we were kids. I think I've seen it, but it's a long time. But I think, Maybe 10, 15 years ago, it turned up where I was. We'll, we'll see it. Right? The, yeah. the toys will start coming out and, you know, yeah. an animated se series and so on. But, yeah, I mean, it, it is the quintessential Christmas ad because they've got more than one Christmas to build it up, right? That's they, well, the trick. yeah, exactly. The years and years of, of, of equity built up. Uh, but but ultimately, right, the great story about not doing new ads because, and I think this is an actual data point, four out of five new campaigns aren't as good as the one they replaced. Yes. Now, that might be just yes. the time factor, but that's a meaningful factor nonetheless, right? If it's new. Well, you've then... reminded me of something I usually do in pitches, which is I say, I'll save you half your marketing budget overnight. And they're like, well, how can you do that? I said, well, because on my database, I'll tell you which half your ads aren't working, which half are, and just run the ones that are, right? Don't have to produce anything new. Mind-boggling. You know, yeah. I know. But, but you can sense a disappointment. No, I've, ju I've just served that, up hey, some really we, good oof. news, and the, and the disappointment writ large going, well, I'm not going to make a new ad now. You see, it's, you see your podcast seat. It's like most marketing podcasts are so full of cock and nonsense and pointlessness. <laughs> but that point just there, that's better than any point. Do it again. Say it again. So you're saying okay, that, right? So I turn up to Wait, wait, listen, okay. listen, listen to me. You've, you'd all listen to these podcasts, listener. And what you get is essentially no added insight and just two, usually two blokes, unfortunately, like this, talking to each other and not adding any value at all, right? Well, John just dropped there in a very sort of you know, casual fashion is like a real, a double humdinger in my opinion. Just go on, do it, there you go. Do, All right. do it so in slow motion. It, okay, here's the thing. So uh, I can go to any you of You go a client. Uh, go into a client, any advertiser you want to mention, and I'll, t and I'll say, I'll tell you which 50% of your ads are doing nothing for your brand in the long term. 
and which ones are. And you could now take the ones that work and you could air them, not have to produce another ad, and you could optimize, you could optimize your uh, creative ESOV so overnight. So, so, that's the, right. so that's the first of the two big yeah. points, right? The first killer point is literally by doing less and doubling down with the media on the creative that does more. Just your media decision. Which creative do you put on air? We can tell you because we've tested it all. Which creative put on air and which not? Just optimizing that. And the impact would generally be a... Uh, if you could put a bullshit effectiveness maximize, like well, let's let's say okay, let's pretend it's one star, one star over all the testing we've done with the IPA, going back at the database or that sort of thing, would equate to about a percent of market share on average. So you're saying if I kill your threes and, yep. and you just use your fives, yep. it's worth a couple of percentage points of market share. I'm saying that. Holy smokes! Now yeah. that's that's yeah. only point one. Yeah. The second point you made was having delivered this. I can give you two points of market share from your existing budget. You don't have to do anything except listen to That's me, it. right? The second point is when you deliver this incredible insight with provable data to back you up, the reaction of the marketing team is, <laughs> oh, shit, we're not going to be making another ad now. Not, oh, shit. You're a genius, John. Yeah. Woo-hoo. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Drinks all round. You can see like, this like look oh, of stuns. Like, what does this mean? Am I out of a job? Yeah. Oh shit! This fucker is going to stop me making more ads and having fun with agencies. But I tell you what, I actually did do this as a CMO in a real job, right? Previously with this data, and I tell you what exactly what happened. I, I said to that, I, I better not say who it was. I said to the the team, right? Um, unless your new ad is better than last year's ad, you're not going to make it. And they're like, oh. Okay, well, we better go and test last year's ad. Last year's ad, 5.6 star. It was the best ad <laughs> in the category. And, and, and so why bother? They, right? they said, but they, they're quite young. They were going, but we haven't made a TV ad before. We want, it, we want, the, you know, we want the, be able to put it on our CV. And then they said, what are we going to tell our customers? And I said, <laughs> let me tell you what you're telling your customers. You already have the best ad in the category that already is going to drive market share. And you go to Tesco and go, I want Gondoren number one. And all those idiots making their new ads that haven't proven themselves, they can have the rubbish ones, right? It's brilliant. And they're still disappointed. And they're still disappointed, right? Because they're like, yeah, but what, what, what do I put down in my PDP for next year? Because I wanted to learn how to make an ad. And I said, because you put the business first and that should get you promoted above anything. Because you, you made a decision against your own, you know, personal development plan, but it was the right thing for business. That's far more credible in a boardroom than look at my new ad, which, oh, that was, that's not as good as the one we did last year. That's not another great look, is it? But it doesn't matter because we got to make a new ad. And, well, I know. And you here know, we go again. Exactly. Right? You know. and that, the that's yeah. fascinating. I but, have to say it's fascinating. The trouble is, of course, most CMOs are fired every 18 months, right? So the problem is all this institutional knowledge, well, this is where the database comes in, right? Because all this knowledge just goes out the door and then a new person comes Someone in. Someone comes in with a let's new make vision a new ad. and a new agency. I've got my agency. Oh, no. I've got a new vision. Let's, let's reposition and off we go. I've seen a couple of times senior marketer, CMO come in and go, there's not, not much broken here. Keep the campaign. It's working. Do this, do that. And you think, yeah, you're a smart one. Do you know what I mean? I saw it once recently. Now, it was um, Hotels.com. Captain Ob- was it Captain Obvious? I think in America. Yeah, I know. What the they campaign. they actually changed creative agencies. The new creative agency kept the campaign. Kept the campaign, and I was like, bloody well done. Very I mean, that, that. Yeah. that you know you're getting good advice. Now, if I mean, an agency does that, you know. Well, they're, I they're, would say to you, and I'm sorry to be cynical. No agency on earth would do that. I suspect the client. Mm, uh, yeah, true. I mean, if the agency if the agency did, did that, I would pay them double. If the agency said we like this work, yeah. we'd like to keep going with it. You, you'd love that agency, yeah. But I'll bet you the client went. You know when they do the pitch and they go blah blah blah. We want this, we want that. Oh, and also some of the some of the other points at the end on the backslide. Don't change Captain Obvious. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the first rule. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay, here's here's the other challenge you get in this situation. <clears throat> I've been in a situation five star ad. Go back and share the results with the creative agency. Disappointment. Hey. And, and I tell you why, right? And I've had this from a CEO of an ad agency who said, John, the problem is. We won't get a brief next year because it's too good. And I said, okay, that means that means your remuneration uh, agreement with wrong. me is totally wrong. I will pay you three times the fee to make a five star ad That's because right. I'll drive market share. You can have a cut of the upside. And a I w- we won't waste our time. <laughs> yeah. You can go and pitch to someone else. Very good. Or do you know what's even better? I will give you my next brand and go do a five star on that one and then that one and then that one. And by the way, you'll be loved in this company forever and you'll be iconic and you know use that on, on your creds and off you go. So I think. But it's the, 
the, the, the incentives in the our, you know in our industry are just stacked in the wrong. Well, in, in, the wrong in way. marketing world, we just say it's product oriented, right? You're you're attracted to making products, not necessarily satisfying the ultimate customers. That's a byproduct of it. What I really want to do is make lots of this stuff, which, in my opinion, I like. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the great irony is there's an enormous amount of product orientation at the very heart of the marketing industry, yeah, which is a mind-boggling thought. Yeah. Should we get into the best hours of the year? Yeah, well, Let, we let's again, count them yeah. down. Yeah, exactly. Right. So what we've done, uh, we've scoured the database. This is the UK database. We, we test uh, 95% of all ads that go on air. We don't do government and a few other little bits and pieces. And right. you're still pre-testing for clients as well. So we do. Yeah, we do two things. So um, we, do, we do a full diagnostics guidance advice for clients who want to optimize their ads. And then we provide access to a database where we have a live feed of all their competitors. So I don't know, if you're... Uh, Adidas is one of our clients, right? So they get a feed of all the Nike ads when they go on air, get the feed in, and we test them and we send them the results so they, they know where they so are. So that's a beautiful thing, talking about product orientation and market orientation. Again, competitors looking at another competitor's ad and forming conclusions is pretty much the dumbest thing you'll ever <laughs> do, right? But getting data for how the target market perceive the ad in real time Yeah is a really different thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I wouldn't trust a brand manager to rate their own ads or the ads of their rivals because they're too caught up in the industry, right? Yeah. And I've had that experience myself and I've got too in deep with a client, right? We didn't you, you see do, You do, you do. You get, you get too close. I mean, the other good thing, going back to our previous comment about just change your mix, right? We, You could probably take an average advertiser against a great advertiser and beat them purely because no one makes good ads all the time. Very few, maybe Yorkshire Tea, Audi potentially. There's, there's a handful, but yeah. most people don't, right? So um, you can take an advertiser that sometimes does great work that might spend a small amount on it, but mostly does average work. And as an average advertiser, you could beat them simply by understanding your data, working out what you do well and optimizing the shit out of it. And if we talked not financial subs, but percentiles, for a decent sized national campaign, the fee to do the system one test, at least let's turn into yeah. an advertising yeah, yeah. Uh, advertorial for you, but I'm, I'm interested <laughs> in this. It would be what five percent? It wouldn't even be five percent. Oh, oh less than one. I mean, Fuck yeah. It. I mean, talking six. Well, six grand for a test. Let's say. Well, you'll, you'll get the numbers yeah. out now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. I'll have one of them. Yeah. 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 So it's six grand for a test. So we're talking about an average agency spend, let's say, four five hundred grand and yep. above, right? Yeah. For six grand, you can effectively beat better, bigger players just yep. by being smarter and spending six grand on research. There you go. And for 30 grand, you can get every ad that ever aired in your category. And for 35 grand, you get that <laughs> and you come around and wash their cars every week. There you go. You know, you know what I'm doing at the weekends. <laughs> Brilliant. Hey, no, there I'm sold. Go. I'm sold in it, mate. Okay. Right. Here we top, go. Top five. Uh, top, top five. All right. So let's. Uh, so these are uh, System 1 database, UK. Uh, so we're probably talking 20,000 ads. In a number five, uh, a very well-known advertiser. Oh, and we should add to, for our listeners... Because I live in Australia most of the time, I have no <laughs> idea about any of these so, ads. So to help you out, Mark, we're going to play the ads. Thank God and for so, that. And as we're on video now as well, we'll be able to see the ads. And apologies if you're listening, but hopefully you'll get the idea. Well, thank God for that, because otherwise I would have had to have bullshitted about ads that I hadn't even <laughs> there seen you go. once. This could be fun, though, right? So here we go. In at number five, Cadbury with this very short ad. This, this is, short only, is short? only 10 seconds. Wowzers. Now... There's almost no five-star ads on our database that are 10 seconds. The oh, the, Here's an interesting stat, right? So we have looked at 80,000 ads at the length, at the average star score. Statistically, the best length for an ad is 30 seconds. So It's kind of a coincidence. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Funny, it's, well, it's like Les revealing with Meta. I've gone and looked at 3,500 <laughs> yeah. ads. Oh, it's 60%, you know, which is handy for him, of course. But um, <laughs> anyway, so we, we, we've looked at it, and um, th th this is the case against doing your big 60, 90, and all that kind of thing. So you get a peak at 30. Average star rating, I think, is about 2.7. Uh, it drops at 20, drops at 10, but it also drops at 40, at 60, and, and 90, and so on. And that's so not it, it's, it's like a, the extra cost of your 60 or your 90. You're just saying... Well, you put the media cost in, you just wouldn't go there, right? Unless you were bags of money, or the idea depended on it. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so there we go. We've got that. Cabaret, okay, this, this is Capri. 10 seconds. I better pay attention. This is, yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Blink, before, blink and you'll yeah, miss yeah. it, right? Dad? Well done for tidying your shed. New Cadbury Dark Milk Ice Cream. Ice cream for grown-ups. I have to say that makes me quite emotional because I've got a daughter that age. And um, that's lovely. That's I mean, lovely. It's quite astonishing that in you've got a beautiful connection between two people that we can all relate to. You've got a product shot 
and then you've got a very simple end frame. I mean, see, this is this is Brilliant. another interesting thing. You, you look at we'll maybe talk later about can you look at the extravagance that gets spent on advertising, and then you look at that 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 would have not that would have cost that's got to be less than a hundred grand. Well, it's just I mean, a, it's probably few, it's I don't just know. a bloke with a shed, yeah, and a child actor. One, he lo- one location, he doesn't, does he? One location, two actors, one idea, five point six star. And better than that as well, spike rating. So spike rating, one would be average activation. Max would be about 1.7, 1.44. But what's great about this is 95% of people that saw the ad correctly attributed the brand as Cadbury I in mean, 10 seconds. The magical purple helps, right? Yeah. We have to give a shout out to the Cadbury gang. Um, they won the, the the Grand FE this year. Not the Grand FE. What do we call it in England? The IPA Gold. The IPA Gold FE. Yeah, yeah effectiveness. The FE, yeah, the big one. Yeah. And I think they deserve it. And, and I think it's a story of time, yeah? Um, it's two stories. It's a story of a team that's been there a long time. So if you look at it, it's mostly women who've been committed to that brand for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, right? And there's something in that longevity that we don't see very often. The other thing is I think it illustrates nicely something I've been talking about a lot, which is, Cadbury, as we know, Cadbury have this sort of patchy – history via Mondelez of tax, you know, not because they're doing anything illegal, but because they're pushing generosity. And yet Mm. in years gone by, they've not paid any tax in the UK. And that from people like me was a big source of annoyance. And I think I learned in the end to go, I'd still prefer if you paid more tax, (laughs) but for the consumer, if we're going to be market oriented, they, they don't give a shit. What they see is Cadbury, it's history, the generosity, and it works. And I think, Marketing Twitter gets caught up in this. We, we had a big conversation about BrewDog, you know, being the anti-FIFA sponsor. But at the same time, you know, they're still basically, you know, selling their beer to all kinds of World Cup events. But nobody cares. No one cares. Right? Nobody no. cares. No one mo- mo- do you know what most people took out of that ad? Football. Yeah. Right? Most people just both saw Qatar and saw football. They might have even thought they were a sponsor. I think that's exactly the point, right? So I think what Cadbury have done here is they've illustrated – I mean, it's a single point of positioning, generosity, yeah? And yet, and it goes back to their history and their DNA. It really works in today's climate. It has that emotional charge. It does. Without it being, I mean, it's a small moment, right? I mean, me quite emotional because it's the sort of thing a dad wants, right? Yeah. And you don't get it very often in the real world, but you do get it occasionally, right? And I think that's the, the I always talk about emotion with a small e. We tend to get a bit John Lewis, and you know what I mean, and the blind girl with the broken legs being adopted by the by the man in the lighthouse. And it's like this is that's proper slice of life emotion. Yeah. So it surprises me that's only five, but I suppose it's a yeah. ten second. It's, it's interesting actually on the emotion. What well, there's you're right about John Lewis because what that that kind of emotion slips into sadness actually. And and what you what you want what of course around the positioning of this brand is you want joy, you want uplift, and you want ha- you know you want happiness. Um, is the right kind of emotion to get rather get, than um, the yeah, sort of, you've you know, got an ice cream at the end of the day, right? sent, and yeah. You, yeah, you don't want to be, yeah, you don't want to be yeah. <laughs> leaving them in a miserable place. And in fact, his reaction, if you looked at it, was was very kind of smiley, happy, mm, almost exactly. incongruous, right? Now, there's another benefit of Cadbury, not to not to undermine the achievement because it's amazing. Um, what we also notice on System One database, going back to the ESAV point, is there's about a two star difference in the average performance based on category. So now it's partly the category itself, partly the quality that goes into the category. So on the mm. bottom end, so you'd count that as an ice cream ad, would you? Yes, and ice cream is is second in performance overall behind pets, right? So right? yeah, your shortcut to a good ad, listeners, <laughs> people watching, put Huge. a dog in the ad, you yeah. know, right? But after that, ice cream would be next on the. It's it's like the old MPS days, you know what I mean? I work for brands where. An MPS of plus 15 either makes you the worst brand in the world or the best brand in the world. It just depends what category you're in. And not because of competitors. I worked for a funeral home once that did MPS. And not surprisingly, it's a category where if you got a, you know, if you got a minus 15, you were the champion of the funeral home category. Do you know what I mean? So it wasn't a competitive thing. It was a category-driven wow. thing. Do you know what I mean? Some categories... I guess a politician would love minus 15 at the moment. <laughs> but most of the British ones would, that's yeah. for sure, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so that's number five. We've got Cadbury. So Terrific move, moving on to moving on to number four, and I'm pleased to say, a System One client, we helped with this one. Is Kellogg's uh, another staple brand, and not a brand we talk about as much, perhaps. No, as we should right. No, here we go. Bam, bam, 
comment ça se passe J'ai sur mon lit à bouffer ça en m'embusant dans mon whisky. Quant à moi, un peu dormi, vie débris, mais j'ai dû dormir dans la boutière où j'ai eu un flash. We do breakfast. It's a great line at the end. I've never seen that one. That's brilliant. It's right? a very good line. Rooted in the category, owning the category, very, very obvious where it is. Lots of interaction between people, happiness. The killer for me, I think it's the soundtrack. That soundtrack is doing a lot of good work on that. It just just lifting your feelings about what you're watching. Uh, being and, a bit and very, very well branding. If you look at the fluency, sorry, people won't be able to see this, but if you look at the fluency, it's immediately obvious it's Kellogg's from five seconds, right? You know exactly where you are, the brand, the occasion, it's immediately obvious. So we should we should stop and just remind our, our listeners, viewers, or whoever's out there, right, that w- that is the first challenge, right? First, they must know that it's you. And most ads, up to the seventh or eighth, you know, 80th percentile, fail and fall at that first hurdle, right? They do. And... and I'll tell you a great story if you've got time, John. So uh, many years ago when I was a professor at London Business School, I got this gig writing a monthly case study for the British Airways magazine. It's a long story, right? And it was a great gig because the exposure was fab. Right? But the gift it gave me was I did it for about 18 months, back page of the BA magazine, my, my little picture in a little case study. So I would travel a lot in the LBS days all over the place. So I'd sit there in my seat, and in front of me would be seven or eight rows, right? And I'd, I'd watch these people. And back then, you didn't have your phones, right? So you'd be getting in that magazine. And they get to the back page. I'm like, here we go, here we go, here we go. And, it, you know, 99.9 times out of 100, they, they flick it over, glance at it for less than a second, close oh, it, and put the magazine down. But it was such a gift to see your media in context. Because I was looking at my column for a few days. Oh, yeah, there's my picture in well, it's going to be amazing and blah, blah, blah. I've read it five times, blah, blah, blah. And that's the analogy. That's the gift you want to give marketers. They've seen their ad 55 times. They've looked at it in high definition, back and forward. They've tweaked the edit. And what they're missing is it goes out to people who are asleep and drunk and having sex and looking out the window. And the minute you see an ad in the wild, what you realize is, oh, I need to codify the fuck out of this, right? Without losing to Orlando's point, the narrative, you've somehow got to mesh those two together, which I think yeah, is what this That's exactly does. what that does. Now, number three mm-hmm. is the perfect example of not getting that right. Amazing ad, huh. very forgettable and, and hard to attribute. So, But it still scored highly, eh? It still scored highly because they got the Orlando bit right, which is, you know, show people, tell a good story, make you feel the good. The story compensated it for works, the lack of fluency. Okay. But the fluency is poor. I'm looking so, forward to this. Who is no, it? Well, number three is go visit Turkey. Holy shit. Yeah. Go visit Turkey. There we go. Let me show you this one. Now, the fascinating thing about this is they would have thought they had codified the shit out of it when you see this, right? But they didn't. Here we go. Right, that surprises me because that looks like an incredibly bog standard, yeah, relatively yeah. shit. Ad. Any any tourism ads, right? It could be anywhere. I mean, if uh, you took yeah, Turkey, I'd off give it, it a you'd hard go, two out of five. Where 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 the hell is it, right? We could put like go to Milton Keynes on that. Exactly, and it would sort of make sense. Now yeah. it shows you the power of the category, as in that category. This this is where we get back to our point of uh, relative in the gotcha. category. Now we're going to come back to another another advertiser. Well, wait, let me stop. got so, this right. Let me get this clear. Yeah, the category in this case has two relevance points. First. It's, this isn't, you know, paint, right? You're selling a holidays and vacations is imminently interesting. Yeah. And also your competitive set is relatively shit house. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Correct, yeah. And when did this one go out? Is it more of a winter? This, it, I don't know when then, this one went if, out. This is scoring yeah. highly. This yeah. went out in March. Yeah. And, you, you know, you're in, your, you're in your semi-detached house in Hounslow. What we also found, which is interesting, is during lockdown, emotional response to holidays went up. 
Because obviously what, what we're all missing Ooh, is, is we're missing. Basically, we desire what we can't have. Right, we're missing, and, and our right? involvement yeah. goes. So in recession, I, I'm down on money. I, I'm missing, you know, nostalgia Christmas suddenly means more, doesn't it, right? Same thing, COVID holidays, right? You know, you're exactly making me sad thing. though because I have a client, a big client in travel and I, during COVID and, and the, the, the big, big boss likes me but thought I was losing my marbles during COVID because I was like, you need to keep advertising on TV and you should advertise a virtual vacation as a 30, you know, take them to Rome, courtesy of your brand and just keep reminding them that you'll do that again and, and here's a virtual holiday. And I, I sort of doubted myself in the end because he said, mate, you, you're off your rocker there. But it would have been... It know. would have been awesome. Okay. We're going to come back to this. Actually, when we talk about the biggest advertisers of the year as well, there's another tourism brand coming up. Right, so go Turkey. Well, well done. I mean, well done because you've got into the top five. And also, I don't really know how. I mean, that's a magic <laughs> trick, right? I mean, what annoys me about this is, like, I hope go Turkey listening because it would not take much to figure to sort really this one good. out, right? So I wonder if the music may be again to yeah, our earlier point. The right? music's worth a star on this one, I reckon. Yeah. In yeah. fact, in fact, we can easily test with and without music. So literally, we could value the music. So if I was Cadbury, I'd be well fucked off that I've just been beaten by Go Turkey <laughs> with that piece of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've been beaten by Turkey, literally, right? Cadbury and Kellogg's, you'd be like, oh, come on. Well, I'll tell you what, here's another tip for you, right? Um, so the other thing I suggest is, now, we, we've all been in that situation. You're making a big ad. The agency come in and they go, we're going to have this very famous soundtrack that's 100 grand of usage fee, <laughs> right? Now, usually what you go, I can't, you know, I've only got half a million quid. No way I'm going to do that, right? What they should do, test it like this, with and without the soundtrack, and I'll tell you the market share gain of that soundtrack and whether it's worth getting Billy Ocean or whatever it is. I don't know, made that one up. That's a very you know, good Billy Ocean. Actually. Billy, what, Billy Ocean? Ocean. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. looking when at Go Turkey. Gets tough, <laughs> the going gets tough. tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're older than you look. Um, yeah. yeah, I like that point. And the other thing I would say is, and, and this is a technical experience I've had with clients, if you get that big spanking 200 grand soundtrack and you actually pay the money, the other implication is when the license runs out, you can't show the fucking ad anymore. Yeah. Right? That yeah. happens a lot. Everyone right? makes that mistake. Everyone. They don't go in perpetuity. Oh, I can't even say the word now. In perpetuity. In perpetuity. Uh, they go, oh, well, I won't be around in 12 months. And then that 12 months comes around pretty damn quick. And if you look at some, and we talked about it with the Guinness, I, I talked about it years ago in a column about the, you know, the infamous Guinness Surfers ad, which I never actually liked that much but I called it the long, 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 long of it. That ad's been played more since its TV airing on YouTube and elsewhere than it ever was on TV because totally. it was so praised, right? Yeah. It, it can't have that if you yeah. had an Elvis soundtrack on the back, no. right? It'd and I, I actually, that is an average ad on the database. It's an average Guinness ad. Is based, that right? It is. It's only average. Ooh, that makes me happy because yeah. I've always... because No, it is average. If you say yeah. Guinness surfers, right, any advertising creative like loses their yeah, box, right? they do. And um, I never. I came out at the time I was drinking a lot of Guinness, funnily <laughs> enough, and I just never rated it. I like the the Rutger Hauer stuff. We are really showing our age now, much much more. Anyway, all right. Let's yeah. Go. Okay, we're going to number two now. Number two, uh, interesting. Um, go uh, Greece. One at this. Yeah, go Greece. Yeah, would well, that be good? Okay, in number two, we have got Samsung, and the reason I say this interesting is because very good advertiser, um, but a category. That bad doesn't do good advertising. This is handsets and the handsets. Yeah, the money spent in this category yes, is yes, insane. Yes. It all looks the same. It's a bit like car advertising. It's totally like is. the same spot in South Africa, the same corner. Cheeky millennials yeah, dancing exactly. and singing in you the town it. square. You got it right. This, this, this suffers the same problem. What I love about this is Samsung actually are the proud owners of the best ad in this category on our database, the flying ostrich. I don't even remember that from years ago. I ostrich with a VR yeah. headset, yeah. right? Absolutely frigging brilliant. They demonstrated the product benefit in a really kind of, you know, emotive way. They're back at their game. Now, this is interesting because I think this is a candidate for long and short together as well. Okay, okay. Product launch, but done and in a very selling emotional Selling the product way. and doing the Samsung brand yeah. a bit of good. Strutting your way into my hot. Take your head off, make yourself at home. Have a sleep night and strut on home. Day one, I'm in love with the strut. Day two. I'm in love with the Day three. I'm in love with the strut. Guess what? I'm in love with the strut. I like your strut. Do you want to go strut in the strut? You like my strut. Do you want to go strut in the strut? You like my strut. Then let's go strut in the right now. Now they've borrowed the number one system one tip, which is put a pet in your ad. To be put fair, three them, pets in put your three head. pets in your ad. It's a bit like the soundtrack, isn't it? They've gone soundtrack, gone pets. Funky soundtrack. You know, 
But what they have done is put the products at the heart of it and the product idea of the flip phone comes through as well. So I think it's quite a, and I think, let me just check the other scores, very, very high spike. But in fact, this is the highest short-term response of any of the top five and 95% branding as well. And fluency is good? Yeah, 95%. So it's interesting, right? I mean, my main thought on this one is, is, I mean, maybe I'm being unfair, but it, it is also a crap product, right? I mean, I think it's a crap product with nowhere to go. So they've really done well there by, as you say, they've put the they've put the product in the center of it, in an actually interesting and attractive way, which is always sounds obvious, but it's good. I think you see around the edges what a great creative agency can do. So that choice of soundtrack, right? Which who knows what it is? It'd be some weird thing, but they they've done they've matched that with just perfect art direction with the pets, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean. <laughs> You're kind of like me, right? My big disappointment is when I say to clients, you know, you want to have a jingle. That's what you need. Yeah. You're saying, you know, put a dog or a cat in it. That's yeah. what you want to do. Mate. Well, the thing, things we say time and time again. You have know, a dog. Have, yeah, exactly. Or have a character. Or, or even like, um, I mean, another Orlando, looking at the number of award winners that use as equals and fluent devices or characters has gone down, I think, from about 40% down to about 10. Even though we now Even know though the evidence is really screwed. And, and you look jingle, at those that fluid do it. device, yeah. you're done, Meerkats, right? right? Look at Meerkats. I mean, there's so much evidence out there, but it, it's is just... right? It's gone not down. Gone, yeah, he's got the data on it. It's consistently down. Same with humour, right? So Yeah, know humor's done the same. Humor's yeah. a brilliant, effective tool. It's the ultimate emotion. It's less and less and less. There you go. It's funny. It is a funny it's old funny, world, isn't it? isn't it? Despite the evidence. So if we could do it right now, Frankenstein's monster, right? For <laughs> yes. We'd have a dog yeah. playing with a, f- a fluid device, yeah. right? So the dog will be separate yeah. from the device, right? So yeah. the dog is playing with Jingo, the, the magic Frisbee, whatever, <laughs> and they're having a joke and there's a big laugh at the end and there's a great soundtrack. Pumping soundtrack. Which ends with a jingle. That's it, yeah. Done. And to, it's set in Turkey. This, it's set in Turkey. This time next year, ladies and gentlemen, this will be number one. <laughs> you can set it as your mini MBA case study. Right, so, okay. So don't bother the course. Tw- you've got 24 you hours to Here's, go and make this no, ad. So don't bother the course. Here's what you need. You need an ad set in Turkey <laughs> with a dog, a character, and some Elvis Costello music. Done. There we go. Thank you very much. Simple. Give me 1,500. There we go. Right, okay. So we're getting to number one. I, I was surprised. This is a little surprised, but see what you think about this one. We'd been together for a long time, Millie and me, and I figured it's probably time to ask the question. I wanted it to be really special, so I thought, have a florist deliver some beautiful flowers with a special message and just make it really memorable. Will you get a dog with me? (laughs) Yes. Share something real with a beautiful bouquet, handcrafted and hand delivered by your local Interflora. Oh, it's true, man. There's yeah. our ad, right? <laughs> so that's pretty. You put the dog in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the dog thing's blowing me away. The dog, the dog, the dog thing's a thing, isn't it? Although, to be fair, if you're in pet care, average score in pet care is three point six star. Is your table stakes right? So, I'm not saying these these are pet care ads, but it does show the power. Our relationship with pets is very powerful. It's very, very emotive. You know, it captures our attention. It's why a lot of characters are dog. Churchill the dog, you've got Mick, you know. I think animals as characters are a very, very smart move. It's very interesting, John, right, because I'm hugely opposed to tactical stuff. Not opposed to it, but I, I'm not interested in it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't I, – I always say to my the guys I teach, you know, when the agencies arrive, I, I'm literally coming out the revolving door. Right? <laughs> the strategy work's done and off they go. But there is in this – in your work – these immediate tactical lessons. And you don't really need to know why a dog works. It's brainless, right? It's just a dog works, put it in your ad. And so, you would you would you would yeah. get a percentage point of market share, yeah. right? Yeah. But they most of our listeners work in industries where that would be frowned upon. Correct. Because an agency will I love. That's why that's why you need the data, right? Because you sat in the boardroom going, I'm gonna I'm gonna create this talking penguin that does a dance to a soundtrack and talks about our brand, right? And you'd be laughed out of the room, but that's why you got the data, right? Do you make the do you rational case? If you show that to an agency, which you know, because you really clients shouldn't be getting involved in the nuts of, you know, I want a penguin and I want a puppy and all that. But with this data, we would get involved in it, right? So, totally. So, are you showing? Yeah. Are you sharing this with agencies? Hundred well? percent. So, this is the secret. This is the secret source, actually, for agencies, right? So, what I often say is, I will guarantee you a pitch win next time. Though, how can you do that? I said, well, as a client, no agency ever turned up 
pitched and said, we've gone and tested this and here's the score that correlates to your market share and you can take to your board tomorrow and get this signed off. And that's in the six grand range. That's in the six grand, right? Fuck if me. you do that as an agency, you are home and hosed, right? No shit. Yeah. For six grand, you could just win. You win pitches. pitches. Yeah, exactly. Fucking hell. Yeah. In fact, I, I, in fact, it's quite funny, actually. About three years ago, I just started working with System One, bumped into a former agent, an agency of mine, one of the founders, and he, I, I just made a bit of a brag. I said, oh, I'll win you your next pitch, mate. And he said, how are you going to do that then? I said the same. I said, just said to you. He, and he said, in 40, he was pitching for a global airline 48 hours later. And he said, he phoned me up and said, you're on. Here's the stimulus. Go. And I said, well, you've got to have a good ad, by the way. <laughs> you know, there's no good ad. Also, you know, also you've got to have a good ad. It's a small, yes, you know, yes. small point. As it happens, right? It was a four-star idea. It wasn't finished. They they got it into they got it into like so a, you can run a like a so draft we can run it through. we can run a draft right and, and we can, I mean if we want to we can also adjust for the stimulus so we can go you know there's usually a star point difference between an early stage rough cut you know or a script or whatever and a finished film right but in this case actually it got a four-star even at that stage. Now the interesting thing was they had two ideas right. One idea met the brief from the airline and the budget. The second idea they wanted to pitch in three times the production cost, blew the budget out of the water, and they said, how do we sell this in? I said, I'll sell it in for you. I tested it. Extra two stars. The other idea was two star. That was four star. I said, the market share alone has just paid for that production. And they got the production signed off. Three times the budget that the client walked in for because they had the evidence, right? It does sound like I'm like I'm doing some kind of advertorial for System One. Like, I mean, really, John? That's amazing value. <laughs> yeah. What incredible value! Tell, there you go. tell the listeners again. Sign up here. Yeah, what, what a great value <laughs> offer. But I'm genuinely blown away by. I mean, I always like your data. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You were you've always been kind enough of to send it to me. But you start thinking about how you can use it. It's it's yeah. mind boggling, and I yeah. I'm not a fan of pre testing. You know, I sort of go. I, I, I'm not. I wasn't either. Actually, I I, I would spend four weeks in qual groups you know, people dissecting my ad. And then I mean, uh, the, the worst story I had was um, uh, working on a big energy drink, right? I had like world famous Hollywood director mm. lined up mm. ready, right? I mean, someone I think is just amazing, mm. right? <laughs> but I'd agree with my team that they could pre-test, but in, in qual groups, right? Not even quantitatively. They took four weeks. I lost the deal with the director and the director I ended up with nowhere near mm. the same quality. I was gutted. All right? for a load of bollocks and as well. And it yeah. came back and said, well, this, well, that. And, and you know, you know qualitative research is like, you just get a bit of this and a bit of that. And, and it ends up saying the original idea was fine, right? The, but the difference the director would have made with the treatment, the production, the way it was done, done that would have been worth any bit of research. So, I mean, for, but this is where the System 1 thing came in because at the next time I then met System 1, actually, after this experience, right? And then... Um, I'm like, what, 24 hours? And I can get a quantitative. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? I can put seven ideas into test and the next morning know you which one to do. And then, and then I went straight to the boardroom and I remember the CEO at the time going, before I give you the money, John, right, I want you to guarantee me this is a success. I'm like, come on, dude. Like, we're marketers. We know there's no guarantees and the sun might shine and it might rain, whatever. Competitors might do this, whatever. You know that, come on. You know, they might put their prices up yeah, and down. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. come on. We, we, you know, you can't allocate the impact of advertising. And then I met the guys at System One, uh, John, the founder. And, and I said, are you sure you can correlate this to predicted market share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me show you how. So that's amazing. I said, can you come to my board meeting next week? Because I'm always going, we should do this and here's why. You go in and go, and here's the data. And this is how much it was. And like here's the market share. And they're all going, oh, K, you know, our KPI is, you know, to grow market share off percent or whatever it was that year. Everyone's going, bonus lights are going. You can see, you can see around the room going, oh, and what was, I'll tell you the, the mm. best bit of the story. So we had the, we had the board meeting, right? An hour, when an hour and a half my slot was to sell this idea in. I basically got John to do the presentation. Here's the data, here's the science, whatever. And the CFO was like, I never knew marketing could be accountable. And, yeah. and, and it, was like, it was like this dawning realisation going, oh, I can measure marketing now. Can I like, like this investment? This is yeah. lots of millions. This was big, big millions, right? And then what was really funny, the best bit, right? So a week later, we're trying to work out how do we get into our bonus that year? How, you know, and we're having a tough year for other reasons, right? And we had to make some budget cuts. CFO says, 
the last budget we are cutting, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Now, you know this, right? The marketer, biggest budget in the company. Where does everyone go first? So, okay, let's go to John's marketing budget. Let's let you take it for the team. And the rest because, of us will just sit here kind of like because, almost playing poker. You know? Because it's seen by almost everyone as a cost. I mean, the cliche it's is It's discretionary. Right? It's a cost. Yeah. We, we, you know, we've given you that money because we thought we had to, yeah. but we'll take it off you if we need it because we yeah. don't associate it with any upside yeah. until you start having until the data. Until you've got the data, yeah. Right? Yeah, very impressive. It, it turns it on its head. So did you tell Interflora this news yet? Have you let them know? This that? is breaking news. We're, bre- we're breaking the news wow. now, right? And again, you know, I mean, it's a good ad. I mean, it's a good ad, short and long, right? Both, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's branded. This is this is the weakness in that ad, right? See, this uh, is where... If you're into Flora, you kind of... This is, this right, is a, yeah. Well, this is a problem with... this is Because they're category leaders, right? So they'll get the benefit. This is this is the problem as when you're doing your, marking your own homework. You're looking and going, of course I know the brands, right? Yeah. This is why you've got to go to consumers. Because even though you've said it three times, consider, like we saw with Turkey, Consumers don't get it. You have to be over. And this is where fluent devices are genius. Because if you've got a fluent device, Kevin the Carrot, Churchill the Dog, etc., people know who you are. You don't need to say who you are. People just know who you are. Mm. And that's the power of long term, doing things consistently, building up that equity over time. Absolutely important. Yeah, they got it. Well, well done into Flora. Now, what I thought I'd do as well, let me tell you the top five advertisers. We've just gone through the... Ooh, yes. uh, okay, so this the, the, they're the top five spots, as it were, that appeared on the... Executions. The, ex- executions, yeah. But I think it's good to recognise... So you've accumulated all the scores. Exactly. So we've got, we, you know, we've got every campaign that airs, so we can look at the average per advertiser overall, right? So we can say, how consistently good are they? Okay? So we, we can work Bring that it out on. too. Okay, so here, 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 we're gonna go. here we're going to go. Top five again. So number five, Beer Moretti. Is that right? It is. Now, they only had, I think, two campaigns. So it's on yeah. a small base and they got a good result. Four star, right? So you could be, could be what now. Interesting thing with beer Moretti, back to the point. As you remember the ad, it's got like bottles of beer Moretti being, you know, slung down a clothesline in a beautiful Italian yeah, kind yeah. of, you know, town. Gorgeous square. advertising. It's yeah. beautifully shot, right? Despite the product being on in almost every scene, fluency, 50%. Which I thought was fascinating because I guess it's it's, it's not a distinctive. It's, it's not distinctive either, though. Really. No, you think about Moretti, it's, it's there. perfectly category generic in a way. Mix, it's it like, get mixed up with Peroni all the mm, time. Mm. Yeah, interesting. But yeah, not not a sin of the ad per se. Yeah. a sin of the product itself. That's right. Exactly. Number four, going back to our uh, going back to our ice cream from Cadbury, Hagen Das. But again, what they're doing is category. They, 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 they consistently do four star. It's a bit like having a pet in your ad. It's like we're going to show you the we're going to show you the ice cream. We're going to show it being stirred yeah, very yeah. slowly. Beautiful music, beautiful people. You know, it's it's doing the category a lot of heavy lifting. I mean, it just makes you think and feel ice cream. I've always found the Hagen Dust Ben and Jerry's rivalry, which goes back about forty years, is fascinating. If you ever look into the story. It's a made-up name, right? It's a completely means nothing in any language, and I, it, it, of course, it has a storied history, right? As being one of the, I mean, it was Hegarty worked on it back in the day when they were doing the uh, Melt Together campaign, early '90s, and from then onwards, it's really been a high, high achiever. So it doesn't surprise yeah. me they're there. I'm glad they're still investing in it because I felt for a while yeah. it sagged for a while. It did. It did. I mean, it did seem to go away for a bit, didn't it? And uh, you've got an, it's special I'm, in the UK, US. It's not a special a brand. I think the price premium is still protected from advertising that was done 30, 40 years ago. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's a classic example of being able to charge more. Yeah. Because you built a great yeah, brand. Really good know? point. Really good point. Now sticking with the theme, so beating it uh, is Magnum. Yes. Actually, which I think does a better job, right? Because Magnum averaged four point five star, almost half a star ahead, and a, and an in, this is an interesting one in the top uh, top uh, five advertisers because it features older people, which is really unusual. I don't know if you remember this. It, it's it's get old or get classic. Is oh the yeah, ad. yeah, beautifully okay. shot, glamorous, but it's people probably in their sixties and seventies enjoying themselves, having fun. I mean, we did a we've done a lot of work on diversity at System One and how to tell people's stories really well. And one of the reports we launched recently called Wise Up is how to show older people in advertising effectively. Because it's not just for pensions. And exactly. Things, right? Well, they, you got it right in one, right? This is the thing, right? We only tested advertising with older people. What we found is they don't want to feel <laughs> seen, right? They're like, don't put me on that ad, you know? Um, that was the first thing. Um, but they want to be shown in a smarter light because basically you've got this lonely old man. You've got the kind of, you know, pensioners meeting up. You've got the saga holidays, right? They don't want that, right? 
they they want to be seen as vibrant, young, enjoying themselves, clever. You know, the, 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 they're not the gag of the joke. They want to be making the joke, right? They, you know, they, there's yeah. loads of cultural references. There's, there's loads to go for. So what I loved about the Magnum one is not only did it score well, but actually it's doing something, you know, we talk about purpose, but, it, you know, it's nice to see an older audience well In a, not, in a know, non-cliche. In a non-cliche setting. way, yeah. Yeah. And, oh, and brilliant. Yeah, so that was pretty good. So number two, we've already talked about them, Cadbury, average of 4.7. So Cadbury consistently do four-star advertising, Quality work. some five-star advertising as well. But what's great is it's 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 every single year they're back out with some very good. And you get the execution. sense they're just layering this sort of purple wall. Yeah, they're they're on a forty-year mission now, right? They've got it, haven't they? They have. It's interesting though because I'm sort of relieved, right? They were the IPA effectiveness winners this year, and your research is confirming it. I just wonder how they would do at Can. With those ads, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I like, think I know the. Answer. I think yeah. I know the IPA yeah. effectiveness awards are a good measure. Make of your choice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I trust System One data, but I wonder how many can gold lions the work would get, and I suspect the answer yeah. would be zero. There's like this Venn diagram actually between the kind of System One data set and the can line winners sort of thing. So how do they it, how, do, it, how do they perform when you look at the the storied British can winners? Yeah. Are they also pretty effective? Well, the uh, the breaking news is oh, we tested every British winner this year. In fact, we've done it for the last 10 years. Uh, to uh, go back 10 years. Well, I, I want to pause and okay. enjoy this moment. Here we right? go. All right, here we go. I want to enjoy this moment because this is make or break for Can. As you know, probably, I've had a huge suspicion that Can is a giant bag of cock, right, all for right. a long time. So To the point where, remember, I wrote my most famous column of all time. Do you remember this? Yes, the blank column. Is the blank column yes. where I see the, the title was something like, here's everything marketers will learn this week at Can," And it was just an empty column back in the days when it was in the one. magazine. And my editor really didn't want to run it, and I almost forced him to do it. But I might be wrong, and you might be about well, to tell me. here we go, Mark. Here we go. You were probably <clears throat> ahead of your time. I'll tell you for why, right? So going, if you go back 10 years, and we've been tracking for 10 years now, um, can line winners are four or five times more likely to be four and five star. And, and they scored, on average, above above norm, right? Going back 10 years ago, That's right? pretty good, right? Which is which is decent. And, well, you, well, and you'd, you'd be happy with that, right? I'd stand, I'd stand corrected then, right? Something happened a year ago. The last two years, the average can line result is no different to the average on our database of all ads. And, and you're talking about the gold, whatever they yeah. are, the gold So, so, so bronze, are. silver, gold, titanium, overalls, whatever. If you take the average score, all those put together, the most awarded in the world, the answer is average. It, it's a bit like... So um, it's I, bullshit, I, I, well, I, I got into trouble with, I, I think I did a Marketing Week article where I see... Do you know the um, random walk down Wall Street book where the guy yeah, goes... Yeah. It's like you could blindfold a chimpanzee, you could chuck a dart at the Wall Street Times, you, you pick a stock better than a stockbroker, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I started out with that story and go, well, it's a bit like that. I could, you know, randomly go through the system on database and pick a selection that matched can, right? So that, you know, that was true. The, um, it's a very good way of putting it, too. The exceptions were, um, and rightly so, if you look at uh, the strategy winner, Cheetos, for example, uh, really, that was that was the one that got the highest system one score and got, I think, a gold as well. But they were they were outliers. So on average, most, most of the winners are one and two star. And that's what, the last two years? That's the last two years. Now, it won't surprise you. The reason is they all mostly uh, over, over um, well, so you know what I was saying earlier? O- optimum length from a consumer point of view is 30 seconds, and after that you lose them. A lot of the can line winners are two, three, four minutes long. So actually, Indulgent pick- wank is the there technical word for that. There you know? go. The second thing is they elicit negative emotions. So they're, they're, they're trying to shock you, Ooh, right? Shock you, yes. There you go. Right, Polarizing. The, there you go. Right, make a point. And Surprise the customer with something they are. don't like. There you go. In your four minute ad, yeah, that sounds. That's right. a, yeah, yeah. Anything else? And <clears> they're <throat> very activational. They're, they're, they're designed to create a, a response, a disaster, emergency appeal or something. You know, it's almost like that. It's it's designed to shock you, create a response, do now, something immediately. That's right. Now I'm being very generic about it, but if you look at the types of winners and the scores, also I bet you, know, you not enough dogs. That's right. There you go. And all of these. <laughs> and, and certainly not sound, other, happy soundtracks. You have a schoolboy era. Yeah. They're all filmed in places other than Turkey. Yeah. Also factored well, that in. We need, we need, there's a shot. We'll move can to Turkey. Films. We're going to Bodrum, shall we? For Bodrum, the, indeed. There we go. Bodrum, Bodrum is, is the new can. Well, maybe we'll do an alternative in Bodrum. We'll get we'll get Turkey. Well, on you know, board. we do this in Australia. We have cans in cans, right? So we do oh, cans. I didn't know that. Cans is our alternative can, and we do it in April. And it's sort of, I mean, it, 
when you get there, that's basically it. We just it's just a conference where everybody gets drunk in the sun. But yeah, we've we've been doing it for a while. But Bodrum is a European option. I too. think that could be good. Cheap flights as well. So is you is your sense then? It's only the last two years. Before that, it was pretty good. Be, before that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's been. I, I, it correlates with Peter Fields' work on the effectiveness of a creatively award awarded. Yeah, work. he was you know, pretty he, critical too. He, but... He's done that thing over 10. I think he had a paper, didn't he, four or five years ago, he The did. Crisis in Creativity, right? But, but he was showing it going back. that there was He was showing issue. a tick up, yeah. We, we, we've we seen it decline and flatten, uh, I suppose. But it's flattened at average on the database. So it'd be interesting to see. I, I mean, you know, people I've spoken to, I, I'm encouraged by the kind of conversations that are happening. So I, I hope, well, a recession is going to, this is interesting, right? We're facing a recession. Mm. Marketing's got to justify itself. Mm. Going out to Cannes having rosé, not necessarily the best of look when you're under pressure. It'd be interesting to see if uh, what I, we see I think you, I think you overestimate the sensitivities of the marketing community, John. I think they'll be there drinking, you know, rosé with their bright red rosy faces. Escape, escape to the Cote d'Azur. Uh, yeah, I think the, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But I'm fascinated by that. Right, okay. So well, let, let's go from can to can because that takes me actually to our number one advertiser on the yes. System 1 database in 2022, which you know very well, mm-hmm. Tourism Australia. Ah, they, Susan and the Mob. Susan and the Mob have played a blinder this year with their new campaign. Now, I know this, but I'm going to give you a self-serving question anyway. And you worked with them on parts of this, didn't you? We did, yeah. They are, I mean, they, they are obsessed with with testing, tracking, improving. Uh, I mean, you know, Susan fires me questions all the time. They really do take it seriously. And they've tested around the world. Because obviously, well, here's an interesting thing. Their audience is not Australians, right? So I, this I'm is quite very aware. So which I'm, you're, Susan, you must have spotted. I have to declare, so Susan's a bit of a friend of mine. And I, I remember they brought out this new campaign, which has obviously done well. And there was a general... Um, meh response in Australia at best. And, and many uh, so-called experts were like, you know, is that the best we can do? A little kangaroo and all of that. And I was so, I, I regret now not going harder on these people and saying market orientation. By the, by the fact you're in Sydney, mate, you're not in the market for tourism Australia. Shut the fuck up, right? You're, you know, you, 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 you've, you literally can't judge a tourism Australia. Right? Exactly. But you try and make that point and you're, you know, you're yeah. lost here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think Susan handled it very well. Yeah, you know what I mean. But that's it's very good. So so overall average Over, is overall average four point eight, almost five oh. star overall, and that that's different executions. That's for the new across, campaign. That's, across, right? that's the new campaign this year. Yeah, exceptional uh, across the whole year. And it's good news for us. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm biased as an Australian resident, albeit British citizen. Um, they've had a tough time, you know, with with the implications of climate change, and obviously with coronavirus, like everyone else. I really, I'm really pleased for that team then, because as you say, they really are sh- scholars of marketing, and it's proof that the data, you know, why do we do research? Why do we test things? Because we learn, yeah. and when we learn, we get better, and when we get better, we evolve, and that cycle turns again. And I'm always stunned, John. I mean, y- you look at most marketers; they don't have to be that smart. What they have to be is is market oriented and data driven. And then they just have to be ready to evolve and learn, right? And if you put that together over a 30, 40 year career, you're going to get to be good. You Do you know are. what I mean? Yeah. You, you, you know, but they're not market oriented or they don't have the data or they're not prepared to learn. And I think Susan is a good example who runs Tourism Australia of a woman that can do all of the above and is humble, you know, mm. but obviously very good. She absolutely brilliant. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the learning you get, like you obviously got your mini MBA, listen to podcasts, there's plenty of books out there. There's Plenty of ways in which you can learn and learn from the best. In it's ways, a, it was, we just couldn't, you know, when we, when we were lads and growing it up, there was, it was very different. It's interesting, though. I, I just this morning, I finished a, a, a 12-week run of mini-MBA with a class, right? And I, I sort of sign off by saying to them various things. But one of the things is don't do another course for a while. Become your own professor. And, and you know, you don't have to learn from from all these other people now. The best marketers can learn from themselves with a bit of data, make some mistakes. And I always say to them, the best thing you see in an annual marketing plan is the first slide, is these are our objectives from last year, and here's how we performed, and here's what we've learned. That's when you know you're in a good company, yeah. right? We're going to start the loop. We're going to start the new year with a loop back. This is what we've learned. Now let's go into this year with those learnings, right? And if you do that over 40 years, you're going to become good. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Totally. But it, it yeah, there's there's a 
there are there are barriers to that mm. that you get. But when you when you see it happening, like with Tourism Australia, right? When you see and, and we said it earlier with Unilever, when you can learn and adjust, you you're going to yeah, do all right. Exactly, and it's not expensive to do, and the data is available, and the people at the experts are out there, and you can do your course at the end of the day. But there, there's something else, right? Which is if you look at technology, which we take entirely for granted, right? And you look at what you're able to do, right, almost in real time now, right? I mean, even in my lifetime, not that old, I'm in my 50s, but doing mall intercept research, it was a, you know, it was a 10, 11 week yeah. process, right? Literally doing the surveys and typing them up, blah, blah. We can now do panel research in a day and a half. Hmm. You can in about the same amount of time. Um, average time? Yeah. Eight hours, 13 minutes. Eight hours, 13 minutes to get a representative sample of respondents. Yeah. Representative sample of respondents. That, that's the average time from when we submit it to the survey to when yeah. it auto gives you the report uh, output on, in your email. So you think about that, right? A bit of briefing either side. So maybe allow 24 hours, but yeah, you can do it overnight. You know, it's, right? it's a, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a day, right? Yeah, it's a day. You, and yet 99% of advertisers spending more than a million quid on advertising aren't really utilizing this yeah. at all, right? And it, it's mind-boggling. It is. It's mind-boggling. So, yeah, I mean, it's time. Time is the resource, right? But I'm really uh, – genuinely, I mean, I came on the podcast to have a chat with you, and it's the end of the year. I'm going to get pissed later, <laughs> I understand. But genuinely, right, you look at what you're knocking out here, and you just think, fuck, system one, man. You know what I mean? The data's interesting. The insights are fantastic. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. it's replacing the world of, I like this ad, mm, you like it too. That's it. Well, look, we've all been in that situation where the chairman's like daughter likes the, the ad, right? You know, we've all been there. Or, or your boss wants the pack shot up early or yeah, wants yeah. more branding or the agency are going, oh, don't tell us to put the brand up front again, all those fights. I mean, I've wasted so much time in arguments with creative agencies where you you literally waste weeks going, I want to go that way. They want to go this way. It's you just argue over it, right? as well, right? I know. And and with this, when I, when I did use it in my last job, I was like, look, let's just test it overnight. We'll solve this over a test, right? Honestly, let the consumer And everybody decide. steps back a little bit. They step back. And then it's not me versus you. It's let, you know, and I, I, I remember actually we were, we were uh, on the energy drink again. Um, we come up with seven amazing ideas. I mean, they were just, mm. I mean, it's the most creative like moment I've ever been in my career. Mm. They were on fire. And there was one particular idea that I was so like in love with. And I'd even cast myself in the lead role. I'd got that taken away. I'd got the accent down. I'd got the like the speech worked out. It'd be way like kind of too, opening a gladiator sort of way thing. You know? too far. Yeah, I got already. well into Danger right? signals, yeah. And I was imagining the different executions. And Picking the up an award. And, and, exactly. And like, thank you very much. Good night. Anyway, the, what was interesting is when we tested it, it was the simplest idea, not the cleverest idea that everyone loved. Mm. Because, of course, they hadn't come on that two-hour journey with That's me right. while we've been sat around kind of, you know, You'd been celebrating. Yeah, we, exactly. crescendo of complex creativity. I needed to go out and have a two-hour conversation with all my consumers to kind of bring them on the journey, you know, if they, you know. But, but you, you've got to start simple and get the idea across them. Do they know who you are? Do they remember you? Do they get the idea? Start uh, with that. This is what we do. Then you can get clever later. I, I was talking to a group yesterday about exactly this point. Brands are, and you get pushback. Brands are little, little things. Yeah, right? they are. To marketers, they're not because it's your career and your pension. But to consumers, even consumers that like you, you're a tiny, unimportant fragment of their life, if you're lucky, right? Mm. And as soon as you get that, you manage brands better, you make better ads, you know? Mm. But if you think that, you know, people really care what your brand's stance on the death of the queen or coronavirus is, <laughs> you're insane. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. you're going to do yeah. shit marketing because you're, you're, ang- you're producing all this stuff which yeah. isn't obvious, isn't going to resonate, and is going to have some highfalutin message that goes right over the heads of people that don't give a shit. Well, yeah, they, we've all also been there where the, the bosses on Twitter see some complaints about the brand. It's like, what are you going to do about it, John? And like, well, actually, I'm going to yes. talk to my audience, my actual this people. This is a big point, right? Because we get these single data points off social media. And again, I always say they're not representative of the market. They're not even representative of the person making the post. Do you know what I mean? They've probably changed yeah. their mind. But when we get those, I, I'll try and think of a polite word in a minute, but those those people from upstairs with C titles that come downstairs with a you know with an incredible insight for marketing from what they've just seen on Twitter, we're we're fucked here. And I'll tell you something: when that happens, if you've got a shit marketing team that are doing bad work anyway, they don't care. They're like, yeah, our CEO thinks we should have this instead. Well, great, fantastic. They don't give a fuck. When you've got a good team that's got research, that's built a great campaign from strategy. And then the bozo comes down and says, I don't like that, do it that way. It, it's soul-destroying. 
So if you can give me the data that says, hey, you know, sorry, sir, but, you know, that's lovely input. Thank you. But uh, it's total bollocks. Yeah. You know what I mean? That is, again, a precious way to defend. Not just because the ad needs to be protected in this case. I, I see what it does to a team when we work for bozos up top that think they're marketing experts. It's it's a problem in the UK. It's a huge problem. It's a massive problem. Austra uh, Australia has a real problem. Oh, really? Oh, my God. It's probably the no I get that comment probably monthly from someone. Like, what do we do when that happens? And until this session... I really don't have a response for them. It's kind of like, well, you know, go and find a company where there aren't bozos at the top. Mm. Everyone's a brand manager, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, everyone's a brand manager, and and the market orientation is a very subtle point. Yeah, it takes a really exceptional marketer to get that point that I don't have any opinion because my opinion's useless, right? And from that point of humility, we can do anything, right? We'll be mm. great, but this data. Is is the defence right? It's the exactly amazing. Right, I'm blown away actually. Thanks. Anyway, mate. I've got to go to well, Turkey now. You've got to go to Turkey. Yeah, we're going to put, shoot the dog. Yeah, in the so ad. To speak. <laughs> <You're> not... <laughs> all right, you shoot the dog and I'll okay, go to Turkey. All right, we'll do that. What a great fucking Christmas ending. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have can in Bodrum. Yeah, you've got, you've got <laughs> limited attention for the consumers. I've just <laughs> yeah. a podcast. They shot shooting, the dog. Shooting a fucking dog in Turkey. <laughs> like, there we go. Yeah, no, we'll we'll get the dog in there. A live dog, I hasten to add. Indeed. Well, as we always say at System One, end on a high. So. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> all right, Thanks, Merry mate. Christmas, mate. You too. Enjoy. Thank you everyone for joining me. I hope you enjoyed that. As always, Mark was on form. Lots of pearls of wisdom in there and lots of opinion, of course, as you come to expect from Mark. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And if you want to follow me, please do subscribe. You can do that over where you get your podcasts. Or of course, you can do it now on YouTube as well. So please do hit the subscribe button. I really appreciate it. And if you want to follow me, I'm over at Twitter at Uncensored CMO. I'm also on LinkedIn where you can find me as John Evans. Thank you so much and see you next time.